Okay, here we go. Stand by. Three, two, one, action. Assume nothing. Rash, bald face, blasphemy. Question everything. I find it extremely hard to imagine. Open your eyes. It is quite all right to be an atheist. The fastest growing group of people in the country has been measured as being those who have no belief or who are atheists. You don't have to be apologetic or quiet about it. Challenge the opposition. You see religion on a hundred fronts losing the argument. And start thinking. This is The Thinking Atheist Worldwide. Tonight's podcast is brought to you by Audible.com, a leading provider of spoken audio information and entertainment. Listen to audiobooks whenever and wherever you want. Yes, we are going to talk about the Civil War pterodactyl here in just a second. I don't know if you follow the Facebook page. It's too good not to talk about. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, forgive me. I just came off watching again this video on YouTube called Devil Baby Attack. Have you seen it? It's a marketing gimmick for some upcoming film called The Devil's Do. And I don't know if the film's any good or not, but the gag they did with this devil baby is awesome. So I've, I've been laughing my ass off, off the air here, and I, I'm trying to focus <laughs> as we do the show. If you get a second, check it out. Have you guys on the chat room seen it? They take this animatronic devil baby. It's like a younger version of Chucky from the horror films. And they put it in this baby carriage, which is remote controlled. And this thing sort of drives around city streets. And when people reach over, oh, look, sweet baby. This hideous looking devil baby just sits right up and <laughs> people flip out. Now, it's a visual gag. So, you know what? I'll link it in the description box. I'll go back after the fact. I will put the link in the description and laughing for about an hour over this particular video. So anyway, I'm sorry. Uh, real fast, let me do some due diligence here for the sponsor of our show, Audible.com, a leading provider of premium digital spoken audio information and entertainment on the internet. They're a service that allows you to choose audio versions of your favorite books. They've got a library of like 150,000 titles. And you can purchase individual books or you can sign up for an Audible listener program, which gives you book credits for a low monthly fee. And uh, right now I'm on Audible listening to uh, Dr. Peter Bogosian's latest book called A Manual for Creating Atheists. I know I brought him up several times, but his book's just causing a lot of waves out there because I do a lot of driving. I like to listen to audiobooks. I downloaded the audiobook, Specific Tips and Tactics if you're in discussions with religious people. And these tactics are designed to help talk religious people out of their faith. And it's really interesting stuff. By the way, did you see Tom Gilson? over at thinkingchristian.net. He was speaking out against the book. I think he's written a counter book against it. But in his own review said, hey, this book is very likely to make atheists. Well, what does that say about the theist position? It was just awesome. By the way, also available audible.com is the new book from tonight's very special guest, Steve Wells. Now it's called Drunk with Blood. I don't know if it's new. It's recent. Drunk with Blood, God's Killings in the Bible. From the description, it includes a separate account of each of God's 158 specific killings. Now, these stories fill the pages of Scripture, yet you don't hear about them in Sunday church. They're ignored by most believers. You can get that or any free audiobook and your 30-day trial and support this show by signing up at audibletrial.com slash the thinking atheist. I had to apologize, by the way, to my guest. I knew it was going to be a longer monologue. And I wanted to, first of all, let you know what was coming up. Tuesday's show next week is going to be Should Scientists Debate Creationists? And this is on the heels of the headline of Bill Nye, the science guy, debating Ken Ham at the Creation Museum. Coming up on the 28th, we're going to talk again to Dr. Daryl Ray, one of my favorite people in the world. We're going to talk about the topic religion and shame. Atheism around the world is coming up on the 4th of February. We focus so much because I'm an Oklahoman. We're here in the United States where the show originates. Quite often we end up ignoring much of the rest of the planet. And we're going to explore atheism in other parts of the world. And I welcome your input. What's atheism like in 
your part of the world? What's the culture like? What's the reaction to religion or non-theism or whatever? And then tentative in mid-February, and I'm still working out the details, it looks like we're going to get Dr. Jerry Coyne. And I'm going to call the show Why Evolution is True after Dr. Coyne's book. This is an exciting show for me. When I was a believer, evolution was like this sort of story handwritten by the devil himself. It wasn't just a theory that we disagreed with. Evolution was somehow part of a sinister plot to corrupt young minds with Satan. And it's amazing how stigmatized it has been. And of course, on the other side of that wall, now you look around and you go, well, evolution, it's, it's observable, it's happening. And the flop sweats on the brows of the creationists who are trying to defend a young earth and a magic man in space and all of that stuff. Well, it's becoming harder and harder for these guys to, you know, they're getting laughed out of the room. Anyway, we're going to have Dr. Jerry Coyne on the air, I think, in February. And we're going to talk about that. We may have to ask him about this Civil War pterodactyl. Now, here's what happened. I had somebody send me a picture and a link to a Facebook page called Biblical Creation. Her name is Tara. She sent it to me. She said, you got to check this out. And its headline on Facebook was, and I kid you not, Pterodactyls shot down in modern times, question mark. And there were photographs. So they had these Civil War soldiers in front of a dead pterodactyl. The implication is that dinosaurs and humans not only can coexist, they have coexisted as late as the late 1800s. And um, I don't normally waste a lot of time on young earth creationist or biblical pages. I'm not trying to troll other pages. I don't want to give them that much attention, honestly. But this was so priceless that I had to repost. It was just so good. By the way, the uh, Committee for Skeptical Inquiry did a story on this like 10 years ago. It's been around for a while. The whole thing was just a big hoax. I've heard that it was actually perpetrated by the people who produced the film The Blair Witch Project, but you'll want to bet me on that. But anyway, as you can imagine, a truckload of skeptics from our page went over to visit the fine folks at Biblical Creation and interjected, go figure, a dose of science, reason, and common sense. And the protests that came back were along something along the lines of, those angry atheists, they're just upset because God's word is being preached. You know, we're under attack, blah, blah, blah. I don't know what they said, but it's something along those lines. Boy, we sure did ruffle some feathers out there. We must be genuinely stepping on the toes of Beelzebub. You should Google it. Just Google the photographs. Don't bother the people at the site. Don't, don't worry about it. Don't, don't control these people. Just go check it out. Pterodactyls shot down. Civil War. Something like that. Some priceless photographs come up. All right. Tonight's show features the author of The Skeptic's Annotated Bible, the book called Drunk with Blood, God's Killings in the Bible, which we referenced just a second ago. And he also created and maintains the website, skepticsannotatedbible.com. He also has the Dwindling Unbelief blog. Steve Wells, welcome to the show and glad you're here, my friend. Thanks. Nice to be here. You've got a book coming out in weeks, months. How long do we have to wait? I'm hoping it will be out in maybe three months or so. And it's called what? Strange Flesh. What it is, is it's how the Bible is used in the homosexuality debate on both sides. Let's just start at the beginning, probably the work, arguably the work that people most know you for, the Skeptic's Annotated Bible. And it was born of what? Did you come from the faith? Were you a believer at one time? Well, I was, although I was raised in a non-believing family and considered myself an atheist by the time I was 12 or so. I ended up kind of talking myself into it. I ended up, uh, I would argue with anybody in high school uh, about uh, about religion, but I ended up reading the New Testament after I graduated from high school and ended up kind of convincing myself that I sort of believed it. And before I knew it, I was a Christian. I hadn't read the Old Testament, but I read the New Testament, particularly the Gospels, and I was attracted to some of the ideas of Christ and convinced myself that, you know, no Christian thing, and ended up becoming a Catholic, actually, and I wanted to become a Catholic priest, ended up in the seminary, 
So for the first 20 years or so of my life, I was a non-believer, and then I became a Christian and a Catholic and a very enthusiastic believer, and that lasted for about 20 years. And then the last 20 years or so, I've been an atheist again. Those of us who come out of the faith sometimes feel like we've got to go and undo some of the stuff that either we had done or had been done to us, right? I was indoctrinated. I was brainwashed. I was misled. I'm going to go out and try to make this path easier for someone else. Is that what drove you? What happened, actually, what spurred it was my sister was becoming a Jehovah's Witness. And I, I decided that in order to talk her out of it, I needed to read the darn thing, you know, read the whole Bible. I'd never read it. I'd read bits and pieces of the Old Testament, of course, all of the new. But I decided that if I'm going to really talk her out of it, since our focus is so much on the Bible, I needed to read it. And so I just started reading it. This was after I no longer was a believer, but it was the process of reading the Bible and trying to talk my sister out of becoming a Jehovah's Witness that really got me started. So I started reading the Bible and highlighting what I found, the things that interested me or disturbed me, and started to categorize things. And before I got through Genesis, I thought, well, how come no one else has done this before? How come no one has produced a Bible and annotated it that was an objective, well, at least something that would be helpful for a non-believer to evaluate the Bible? And so I thought, well, I'll do that. And so that's, that's what happened. That was about 23 years ago, and I've been working on it ever since. When I first started the Thinking Atheist website, yours is one of the first resource links that I put on our resource page because it was pretty thorough. It was very well done. Obviously, you had spent a lot of time going through and putting all of these notations together. How long did the project take or was it an ongoing thing? I spent a, a few years I was working, of course, at the time and, and had a family, so I couldn't work full time on it. But I spent pretty much all of my spare time over a three or four year period getting through it and trying to get it into a form that I could get a book produced. I wasn't able to find a publisher and uh, I got a little discouraged and, and then the web came along and I thought, well, I, you know, it'll work there. So I put up the website in 99, then just kind of kept working on it from there. Of course, I've added the uh, Book of Mormon and the Quran to it as well. I'm looking at the categories in relation specifically to the Christian scriptures, I don't know if you have these same categories for the other holy books as well, but you break Pretty them much, down yeah. into different categories, including absurdity, injustice, cruelty and violence, intolerance, good stuff, contradictions, conflicts with science and history, biblical family values, interpretation, misogyny and insults to women, sex, false prophecy, and misquotes, language, politics, and homosexuality. You've got whole sections sort of separated out by theme so that people can see what the Bible's true family values and true morals are, correct? Mm -hmm. Have you been surprised at how many people who held the scriptures to be true didn't have any idea what was in there? Yeah, that is surprising. But since I was one, you know, <laughs> it shouldn't be that surprising. You know, when I was a Christian, I... I just couldn't make it through the Bible. I tried, but I'd get bogged down in Leviticus, and, you know, it's hard to get through that. So it is surprising because it seems to me that if you're a believer who is basing your beliefs upon the Bible, then it seems that you really have an obligation to read it. If you don't, then it seems like you're either being lazy or dishonest. You know, you can't really say you're basing your beliefs on a book that you haven't even read. How did you handle the Book of Mormon and the Koran when it came to the Skeptics Annotated site? Did you bring in people who were ex-believers in those faiths, or did you just baptize yourself neck deep in the theology? Well, you know, the um, Book of Mormon and the Koran are things that I just sort of added as I went along. I was living in Pocatello, Idaho at the time that I did the Book of Mormon, and that's about 50% Mormon. And so a lot of people that I knew in town were Mormon, and so I, it just seemed like a natural thing to do. And the Book of Mormon isn't nearly as long, of course, as the Bible, so it wasn't, it's not quite as involved a project. But it's also one that I haven't done as thoroughly. So I'm trying to, I'm, I'm in the process now, and I do hope to get the uh, Book of Mormon out in book form, hopefully this year, but within a year anyway. So I'm going through it again and trying to do a little bit more thorough job in my annotations on that. Give me some specific examples of what the Skeptics Annotated Bible is helping to bring to light. 
The stuff that actually sort of helps to draw a circle around the fact that this is not a book after which one should pattern one's life. The Bible does have some good stuff, you know, some things that when you go through it, you mark it and you say, you know, that's a good idea. And I think that people should adopt that idea. But it's surprising how little that you would feel that way about. I'd probably have a couple hundred things that are in the SAB, but, you know, thousands of verses are highlighted as being either cruel or unjust or insulting to women or whatnot. But there are, you know, there are some Leviticus 19:18, love thy neighbor as thyself. That's a, that's a good verse. The trouble with that verse is that in the next chapter, God commands you to execute homosexuals, witches, disobedient children, and adulterers. Usually it specifies by stoning. In one case, it says you should burn them to death. And it's hard for me to understand how, how God can suggest or tell you to love your neighbor as yourself, and then in the very next chapter, tell you to be stoning them to death. And there's a lot more of that. (laughs) There's a lot more of the intolerance and cruelty than there is the actual good stuff in the Bible. Like if your child talks back or disobeys, the punishment, it's not a time out in the scriptures. No. (laughs) You know, the punishment is much more severe. Yeah, it's death, actually. And it is a command by God telling you to do that, which is really strange that people could have that. It seems like if you're going to be a believer, you'd have to say, well, okay, that should be removed. (laughs) <laughs> you know, we got to get that out of there. But it never happens. Were you surprised at the Bible's attitude toward women, Old and New Testament? Yeah, I was. There were a lot of things in there that are just deeply disturbing. I mean, the Bible talks about how the worth of women versus men, and there were, it actually talks about gives a dollar amounts. Women are worth half as much as men. And if a man even suspects his wife of being unfaithful, then... You take them to a priest and you drink some bitter water. And if you were unfaithful, then your thigh rots and your, I forget, belly. Uh, But there's something horrible that happens to you if you, basically it's poison if you are guilty. And then if you're not, then it's okay. But in any case, the man is considered blameless. Women are just not treated well at all throughout both the Old and the New Testament. Well, that's my next question. People come to you and they say, well, it was a different time, different culture. They had to have a harder edge. They had to have different measuring sticks for justice. Ignore what's in the Old Testament and read only the New. But the New Testament doesn't get off the hook, really, either. No, it doesn't. And it especially doesn't when you consider Jesus. You know, Jesus was clearly believed in the Old Testament. He talked about the flood. He talked about the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. He said that people that didn't listen to him and his followers, it would be worse for them than it was for the people in Sodom and Gomorrah. And then in some ways, the New Testament is worse than the Old, and the New Testament invents hell. And you just can't get any crueler than the idea that you're going to torment someone forever, especially if it's for just being incorrect about your religious beliefs. It's interesting to watch people interpret the scriptures in different ways. You get five apologists who read the same verse, and they each walk away with a different take, a different interpretation on what they had just read. And this is something that you've seen in your own circle as well, correct? Oh, yeah. But one thing that I'm most impressed with with apologists is their ability to both be able to take something that is obviously just on its face, either cruel or absurd, and make it sound almost nice and plausible. It's amazing what they can do. And they're especially good with contradictions. I've almost never seen a contradiction that an apologist can't come up with a pretty good sounding rationale for. I mean, a lot of times it ends up being, well, it could have been this or it could have been that. But still, they do a very good job. Are there any specific contradictions that you've got listed on your site that you'd want to bring our attention to here? Anything that sort of pops out? Oh, I think that the genealogy of Jesus is a good one. You know, it's in uh, Matthew's gospel begins with the genealogy, and Luke also has the same genealogy, and it, it lists the ancestors of Jesus. Well, Matthew goes back to Abraham, and Luke goes back all the way to Adam, and there's only a few names that are in common between the two genealogies, and they don't even agree on the father of Joseph in those two genealogies. So that's a pretty difficult one. Of course, they have a apologist who have a standard answer to that, and that is that one was talking about the genealogy of Mary, and the other was talking about the genealogy of Joseph. But that's not what the Bible says. They both claim to be the genealogy of Joseph. Another one is uh, that I particularly like is a question about John the Baptist, you know. 
John the Baptist was asked if he was Elijah because Elijah was supposed to come back before the Messiah came. And he was asked specifically, are you Elijah? And he said, no, he denied that he was emphatically. And then Jesus insisted that he was. So John the Baptist said that he wasn't, and Jesus said that he was. So that's another good one. But there are dozens of good contradictions. There are hundreds of contradictions that I think are pretty solid, but there are a few dozen that I think are really good. A lot of people in the Bible saw God, but there are verses that say very clearly that no one ever has seen God. You know, so. The Bible contradicts itself on who discovered the empty tomb after Christ's crucifixion. This seems like a pretty major thing to get right in the Gospels. Yeah. And you've got three different accounts, as I understand it, with three different sets of people. The Gospels just totally disagree on the, on the whole sequence of events after the death of Jesus and the trial of Jesus, that whole crucifixion deal. Dan Barker always has that Easter challenge, you know, where somebody's supposed to make a consistent story for the trial and the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus using all of the Gospels. And this is really not possible. Steve, if you have a few minutes, I'd like to go to the switchboard and see what our callers have to bring to the party. That'd be all right? Sure, that'd be fine. Okay, let's start with area code 919. Thanks for waiting. You're on the Thinking Atheist radio podcast. Who's this? Hey, Steve uh, and Seth, this is Michael in North Carolina, very close to Durham, and I'm looking forward to seeing you this year when you stop by. I'm really glad you've got a tour date in Durham this year. Oh, yeah, I'm going to be in North Carolina Um, in mid... June, I believe. So it's, and that's all on the Thinking Atheist event page at thethinkingatheist.com. Looking forward to it. It's going to be a great time. What do you have for me and or Steve Wells tonight, man? So I've got two questions. The first one, how is the book formatted? Is it one of the translations of the Bible kind of with annotations in it, or is it excerpts from the Bible with annotations kind of put in there? Well, it's the the whole Bible, the, the King James Version of the Bible. And it has, it's in two columns, and, you know, the, it has a column with the text of the Bible, and then it just has the highlights and annotations in the other column. Gotcha. Okay. Um, and um, have you well, been to the I website? Had, I, had one other. I have, I have like checked out the website. I haven't gone through it too much, especially now that the book is out. I would much rather read the book, and I'm really looking forward to getting it. But I, I was wondering about one other thing, kind of as mm-hmm. a skeptic. And as an atheist, do you think there's any value in reading the Bible in its pure form, something a Christian would be reading, before reading an annotated version? There might be. What I hoped to do with this was to make it so that a skeptic or non-believer, or even a believer, could read the text of the Bible, and then would have notes that would help to point out things that at least I think that most people would find to be of interest or concern in trying to evaluate whatever the Bible happens to be saying on that page. So I'm trying to make it so that you can read the text there. The entire text is there to read. And then it just has my comments that are things that occurred to me that I thought would be helpful for a skeptic that was reading to point out along the way. You know, by saying the pure form of the Bible, I think I know what you're talking about, right? Do you go back and read the Bible itself before you go back and read Steve's commentary on it? But we don't even have the originals of any of Scripture. And I remember growing up in a small town Baptist church, and they believed that the King James was the only version. Well, now, Steve, you got people who are using almost every other translation other than, you know, they're using the New American Standard and the Living Bible and the New International Version and the Message Bible. Yeah. All these sort of hip sounding, you know, they've taken the Bible and tried to put it in language that supposedly appeals to young people. So there are a lot of different versions often disagreeing versions of God's Word out there, huh? Yeah, and, I, and, that, and that, that is one of the things, the, the, if you're going to read the Bible, that's one of the decisions you have to make as to which version am I going to read. And it was a difficult one for me to make as to which I would use in the, uh, both of the website and in the book. And I chose the King James Version because it is still maybe the most commonly read Bibles even today, and there's no copyright restrictions, so that was another reason. Looking forward to getting the book and seeing you in Durham, Seth. Uh, you guys have a good night, and thanks right. for taking my call. Thank you so much. Area code 850, thank you so much for waiting. You're on the Thinking Atheist radio podcast. Who is this? This is Alan. How are you doing? Alan, thanks for calling the show. You're on the air with Steve Wells. What's going on? Question for Steve from my friend who's currently stuck at work and can't listen to the podcast, which we'll get to later. 
Question is, what do you think of people that state that the concept of hell is due to a mishandling of the original text and wasn't something actually taught by Jesus? Well, I, I have uh, relatives. Uh, I have a sister and a son that are Jehovah's Witnesses. You know, the sister that I mentioned before when I was starting this project, trying to talk her out. It didn't work. She became one. Jehovah's Witnesses don't believe in hell. It's one of the nice things about Jehovah's Witnesses um, beliefs, in my opinion. Um, but they would have a rationale for that. They would have a biblical argument that they would make to justify their position. Now, whether they're correct in that, I don't know, I, I, because I think that the Bible is ambiguous on hell. I don't think the teaching of the Bible is clear enough on hell to say with certainty one way or the other. Either way, are you not doing some rationalization? Either you say hell is annihilation, or you have to make the other leap and say hell is literal and real and eternal and fire, but God is quote-unquote just. And because God is just, he must send the wicked to this place, as if he has no choice. That's the only reason a moral God would ever do such a thing. He must purify the evil. That's a lot of what I hear out there. So people either say, ah, you know, you got the definition wrong, or, well, God, he sends you there, but he has no real choice if you are wicked, that kind of thing. Okay, so that about covers it. All right, man, I appreciate the call very much, and thanks so much for listening, okay? Thanks. All right, take it easy. Bye. Let's do uh, two more quickly, area code 757. You're on the Thinking Atheist radio podcast. Hi, who's this? Hi, this is Ann. I'm so happy to talk to you, Steve. I want to thank you for the many, 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 many times I have checked your website when I need to confirm something. So glad to talk to you. I'm a college history instructor, and I use the Old Testament as a primary source when I teach Judaism. And what I wanted to ask you, um, since you have studied it so very, very closely, would you agree that the Bible is pretty clear that the Jewish people were polytheists? before mm. they became monotheists? Oh, man. That's my position. So I, I didn't know if you had thoughts on that. You probably have thought about this a lot more than I have, but I can see some, uh, some hints at that when you read the Old Testament, particularly when it's almost like uh, Yahweh is competing with the other gods. Uh, exactly. He's jealous of the other gods and don't worship those other gods and don't do it because I don't like it. You should be worshiping me. I'm better than them. Did you want to and, elaborate oh, yeah, on how you came to that position, and Just kind of flesh it out for us. I depended on secondary sources. And I, I'm in the process of reading the Bible with a skeptical study group, but we haven't gotten through the whole thing. But I've just read other sources that talked about the Jewish people moving from polytheism to monolatry, which is like you believe in lots of gods, but there's one top god, and that was Jehovah, mm -hmm. and then eventually to monotheism at some point during Moses. At least that's how it was presented as characterized in the Bible. So I'm kind of dependent on others to give me that view. So I wanted to know uh, from someone who had studied the primary source what he thought. How you just described it there would be my basic impression. I don't have much more than that. And that just seems like it, there is a gradual transition. Uh, and, well, I'm working on it. It takes a while to get through. And if yeah. you're reading the Bible, I'm just curious now. Yes. If you're reading the Bible, I'm so often told... It may be fiction, it may be myth, but it's great literature. And I feel, oh God, no. I feel, <laughs> you know, when, when I read, when I read the Bible, I just think, God, how am I going to get through this next chapter? I just can't get excited about it as a literary work. What am I missing? Do you read it and think, wow, this is important, great literature? Or do you think this is just no, a mess? No, no. It is tedious. It is repetitive. It is inconsistent. It's written in different styles, even within the same book. It's awful. It boggles my mind that it has had the impact it has because it's such a bad work. I mean, there are some great stories. And that's what your preacher will tell you, is the great story of, you know, Ruth, you know, following mm -hmm. her, her relatives. But if you actually sit down and read, holy cow, it's terrible. <laughs> so I'm with you. It's, it's not, uh, not good stuff. Anything else yeah. before we move on, Steve or Ann? 
Well, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have a workshop with my students where they bring their copies of the Bible, and I'm going to have them compare different versions and look at verses. And I've used the Skeptics Bible to choose the verses I'm going to have them look at. I'm not out in front of class. I don't proselytize for atheism or anything, but I am selective in the things I'm going to have them read. So thank you, Steve, so much for your work. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Thanks. Anne, for the call. Greatly appreciate it. Anne's got a great voice. You know what I'm saying? She should do a radio podcast. (laughs) Yeah, she does. I'm retiring, folks. Good night. Steve, talk to me about this book that's coming up in three months. Strange Mm -hmm. Flesh. Obviously a provocative title, but give me some good stuff. I mean, what are we talking about here for the upcoming book? Well, how I started was I have, uh, of course, the homosexuality category at the website and in the SAB, but there's really not a whole lot that deals directly, at least, with homosexuality. Maybe a few dozen verses is all. And so what I did was I, I began with that and um, just looked into each of those verses and then started to look at the arguments that people made, biblical arguments that people were making, either saying that the Bible condemns homosexuality or that it doesn't. And so that's what I did was I just went through each of the passages in the Bible that are used on one side or the other and tried to understand and present the argument that's made. Strange flesh comes from the book of Jude. It's a phrase that's used in the book of Jude, and it's Kind of an interesting one because it's dealing with um, the sin of Sodom, and it's also in the same verse. It talks about the sin of Sodom, Sodom and Gomorrah, and then it also talks about the, you know, in, in Genesis 6, there was the angels or the sons of God that saw the daughters of men and had sex with them and produced a race of giants. And the next thing you know, God's flooding the earth. And it sounds like it's almost in reaction to this uh, hanky-panky that was going on between the angels or the sons of God and, and, and the women. That produced the Nephilim, I'm trying to recall. Yeah, the, uh, uh-huh, that's right. Yeah, The, mm-hmm. the demon-human hybrid yeah. creatures. Yeah, it's one of the really strange little mini-stories in Genesis. And apparently it's kind of wrapped up in the idea of the flood. But anyway, Jude is condemning both the sins of Sodom and the angel women sex deal and he, he refers to it as going after strange flesh and so that's where the title came from okay we'll look forward here in just a few months in the meantime i will link in the description box of this podcast the skeptics annotated bible and uh, i will also put a link into steve's book drunk with blood god's killings in the bible for your work and for the sort of resource that you have given people who just want to go in and sort of find out more about what's hidden in the pages of a supposedly good book. Thank you. Thank you for all that you've invested into this effort and continue to. It means a whole lot. No, you're welcome. Tonight's broadcast brought to you by Audible.com. If you want to listen to it, Audible has it. With over 150,000 titles, virtually every genre, you can get a free audiobook and 30-day trial today. Just sign up at audibletrial.com slash thinkingatheist. Next week, should scientists debate creationists? Is it a waste of time or is it about time? Your comments at podcast at thethinkingatheist.com if you want to weigh in. I'll see you next Tuesday night on the Thinking Atheist radio podcast. Follow the Thinking Atheist on Facebook and Twitter. Watch dozens of original videos on the Thinking Atheist YouTube channel. And visit our website for resources, links, contact information, the editor's blog, and more. thethinkingatheist.com